everyone. Welcome. My name is Andy, and this is the Coffee with the Geek show, February 2019 edition. The focus of this show is to highlight amazing educators and leaders in education. So for those of you watching, my guest today will really need no introduction, but I will introduce her anyways. Jennifer Gonzalez is the creator of what I call the Powerhouse Education website, Cult of Pedagogy. And within this website, there's a blog, which is a must read for educators, a podcast, which is also a must listen to for educators. But there's courses, videos, and swag. And I'm very disappointed. I ordered a coffee mug yesterday, and I should have ordered it long ago so I could have showcased it. Uh, so uh, it'll be coming, though, so I'll be, be very excited. So um, a little bit about Jennifer, in case you don't know. She is a national board certified teacher with over 10 years of classroom experience. She taught uh, middle school language arts, college level, where she trained pre-service teachers. And in 2013, she created the uh, Cult of Pedagogy website and works full time now helping teachers improve their craft. So we'll start off with the easy question, Jennifer, uh, speaking of coffee and my coffee mug. Um, welcome. And um, can you tell me about your favorite blend of coffee? Andrew, thank you very much. And yeah, I, I happen to have just heated up a cup of coffee. I, I don't know if it's my favorite, but we drink a lot of um, Starbucks Cafe Verona, half decaf, mm. half regular. <laughs> 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 and it's funny because we did a whole taste test with a bunch of different bags one day. So that's what we settled on. So yes, I'm definitely a coffee drinker. Very nice. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll give that a thumbs up. <laughs> so um, we talked a little bit in kind of bulleted points about your, your education background, but can we dig a little mm -hmm. deeper and say like, what, what was your journey in education? Uh, just take it from there. So, you know, my journey and what was always my plan was to just be a really good, solid English teacher pretty much for life. That was always the plan. And I always thought it would be nice to teach college at some point, but I figured I would have to go and get a PhD and, and do all that. So it was just a pipe dream. But I took a couple of years off from teaching to raise a bunch of babies. And during that time, I was called by a local university that said they were hiring national board certified teachers to teach undergrads. So I thought, heck yeah, I definitely want to do that. And <clears throat> I really fell in love with that, with working with teachers. And so that's what took me in another direction. Um, and at the same time, I had to earn just six credits, six graduate credits to keep my teaching certification. So I just decided to do some ed tech stuff. And the program that I was in required us to set up a WordPress blog and submit our um, assignments as blog posts, which I can I see these all the time now. And so that taught me how to make a blog. And I really, really overdid all of my assignments on that, way more than all of my classmates. And I thought this should be telling me something that I think I really like doing this. So I just started another one and, and really went full time. I, I kind of had the choice between going the PhD route and really doing the college uh, teaching thing f seriously um, or doing what I'm doing now. And uh, I feel like I'm probably reaching more people this way than I might have if I was um, in academia. So you talked a little bit about maybe the the genesis of <laughs> Cult of Pedagogy. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of the nuts and bolts? How did it, how did it all get started? How much time did it take to get started? Well, you know, it just basically it just started out as a regular blog. Um, and really, I was just trying to write like a new post about every week. And I would share it with people that I knew who were teachers and ask them to share it with their friends. And so it was very slow at first. Um, and I'd say probably the way that it started to really evolve and grow was I learned about guest posting for other websites. So in 2014, I did a bunch of guest posts. I did one for Edutopia and one for Middleweb. And that really helped to bring more people over to my site. And so I kind of ran with that momentum. Um, and then the, the podcast started to, to grow more. I really liked doing that. Um, started throwing videos onto YouTube. That's always been kind of a, a random occurrence. If you look at my YouTube channel, there's some playlists, but it's kind of, um, you know, a patchwork. And, um, you know, and then I also started creating classroom products and selling them through Teachers Pay Teachers. And and then I started to do a course. It's basically just been sort of every year, there's been another layer that has been, um, that's been added on. And, and now I've kind of stopped adding things on and just maintaining the level of quality that I have with 
those existing things um, and just trying to make sure that I'm constantly putting out really good content on, on the blog because I feel like the blog and the podcast are really the core of all of that. And um, it's just really important to me to, to keep serving teachers and, and putting out the things that I think teachers need to be learning about. And it helps that I have three kids that are currently actively in school. So I get lots of ideas from, from them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Being a parent really helps the dynamic, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I never you, was a teacher when I had kids. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I was a college teacher, but I was never, a, you know, like a middle school teacher. So it definitely changes your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of answered my question. My next question a little bit already is that, you know, you already have the blog, the podcasts, courses. I was going to ask what's next for the blog, but you kind of said you're really just kind of fine tuning what you have right now, right? Yeah. I want to write a book. Uh, it's, it's, it's just been hard for me to kind of pin down exactly what I want to do, but that, that is the next, um, the next change or the next new thing that I would add on beyond just currently doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Speaking of books, and I didn't bring this up in the intro, and I have one of your books and I've had it for a while on my Kindle and it is Hacking Education. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, that is a book that I co-wrote with Mark Barnes um, in 2015. Now I can't remember. He has a whole series now, but Mark and I were were Voxer friends before he started that. And um, I kind of, I, I guess I can take credit for helping him, you know, birth that whole series. We spent a lot of time on Voxer talking about this idea and how it could be a series. And at one point we had even discussed me being a co owner of the whole series. And I decided I didn't want to bite that whole project off. I said, you know, I'll help you get it going, but you take off and, and run with it. And so we, we did the flagship book for that whole thing. And the idea was just that, um, you know, there are a lot of books on education that are, are backed in a lot of research and, um, changes that teachers and, and schools should be making in their schools, but they go through a very lengthy process of implementing a whole new program. And the idea of the Hack Learning series is these are changes that you can implement tomorrow in your school. These are things that you can do quickly and actually start to see results from right away. And so that's always been the um, sort of the litmus test for whether something makes it into the book or not, or any of his books. Um, are you know Is this something that can be implemented the very next day? And, and that is not to disparage stuff that is more in-depth and long-term, but it's to offer you know something else basically to the menu. Um, so yeah, we put together 10 ideas that um, he and I had both either thought of ourselves or heard of other people doing. And um, we've got some stuff in there that's gone pretty viral since then. Pineapple charts we introduced in that book. And I probably a day doesn't go by when I don't hear about schools using a pineapple chart. Um, it, some other stuff too. So yeah, it's a it's it was a fun book to write. We wrote it completely without ever meeting in person. We did it through a Google Doc and Boxer. We would just get on Boxer and talk and we would work on the Google Doc together and presto, we had a book. <laughs> That's really amazing. And yeah. it really just shows, I think, the power of technology mm -hmm. that that you can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, speaking of, of that book and hacking education, and you mentioned kind of breaking it down into small pieces. And I read a, one of your recent blog posts about three things, like getting three things done, which is very helpful, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's actually five. It's do five oh, things. Yes. Oh, when you're I thought overwhelmed. It was three things. Yes. Yes. But maybe if you're that overwhelmed, three is enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did yeah. three and that was, that was enough. So, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, do you think maybe because of, and this will probably bleed into the next question. Do you think because, you know, the things are so maybe overdone in education. Sometimes we need to just break it back down into some, you know, fine bulleted pointed 10 points, mm -hmm. you know, three points, five points. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I'm actually, I know that one of the things we're going to be talking about later is uh, books that I'm reading. And that's one of the books that I've been reading right now is um, Dave Stewart Jr.'s book, These Six Things. And he really does that basically. He says, there's just so much that you could be doing. Here are the six things you really need to be concentrating on as a teacher. Um, I feel like Mike Schmoker's book, Focus, also does kind of the same thing. It takes all the stuff and just says, okay, but as long as you're doing these few things really well, then you're, yeah, you're, and, and it has to do with, you know, reading a lot, writing a lot, um, doing some sort of argumentation. Those are, those are part of the, of the six things in terms of um, just developing learned human beings, basically. 
So let's talk about American education as it stands now. Mm. What is your general sense of how things are going? Positives, <laughs> obstacles, improvement? I know that's a big question, but uh, break it down. I feel like a lot of us have a really good, strong, clear sense of what we should be doing. And that probably has a lot of threads, you know, um, in terms of focusing on allowing students to have choice and allowing you know them to do authentic learning as opposed to just rote learning. Um, we know about them needing to have recess and free time and independent reading and a lot of the things that, um, you know, give them some freedoms. Um, we're also learning a lot about, you know, restorative discipline practices as opposed to just, you know, punitive stuff. So we, I think we know a lot about what we should be doing. And we look to places like Finland and say, why aren't we doing it like that? I think what's holding us back right now is that a lot of the people in charge from all the way from administration to superintendent level to state governments, um, there's, there's a breakdown somewhere in there. And, and I don't exactly know what it is, but I know that the higher up you get, the less educational experience you tend to see. And, and I think those people making the policies tend to take a business approach. And this is where our, our obsession with standardized testing has come from, uh, which is that we should be able to measure our progress and then make cut and dry decisions based on those measurements. And that's it. And, and, and education just in a lot of ways is not a business. I say in a lot of ways because I do think that we are service providers and that our students and parents are our customers, but it's not the same as, I don't know if you've ever heard the blueberry thing, the blueberry metaphor. No, um, but it's, you know, somebody was talking about this whole issue of testing and, and punishing schools for their test scores. And they said, you know, when you get, if you're a manufacturer and you get your raw uh, materials, say they're blueberries, you get a batch of blueberries. If the blueberries that come to you um, are, are, maybe damaged in some way, or they're a little bit too small, or maybe they're overripe or something, you can send it back and you can get, you know, until you get the right kind of blueberries. And you can't do that with students. You get all of the students you get with all of their different complexities and you have to work with that. As I'm saying this, I'm liking the metaphor less than I used to, because I think it sort of implies that students are damaged goods in some ways, but it's, I think it still holds in that, we can't make cut and dry decisions uh, with all aspects of the business of education, and therefore we cannot apply business principles to it. And so I do hear a lot of people speaking out now against standardized testing. Unfortunately, uh, there still is an obsession with getting those scores up. And I, I, I do think that tide is starting to turn, but it's happening very slowly still. <laughs> and that's part of where I feel like my mission is, is I want to find schools that are doing it differently now and are putting an emphasis, you know, putting their emphasis away from testing and shining a light on them. Because I think when schools see other schools that are doing that, it gives them more courage and a template to follow to say, okay, we could do that too. Um, and that's one of my favorite things to do on my site is to find people who are just doing it right, basically, and say, look, everybody, look at what they're doing. Try this. So, um, yeah, I really do think it just comes down to that whole testing model. And and I think we're all just really, really tired of that and of all the consequences that have come from it. And it's just now a matter of, of dismantling that and uh, people being brave enough to get out there and try something different. So it's probably a good time to bring in this article. I, I read an article in yeah. News or Education Week, right? And uh, it was ten big ideas, and the article is by Elizabeth Rich. So it mm -hmm. was called the title is called Ten Education Issues Everybody Should Be Talking About, and I'm not sure they are. So let's just maybe talk about a couple of them. And one of what you said uh, rang true for me about testing. So number mm -hmm. five was a world without annual testing may be closer than you think. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe that bubble is about to burst and maybe we'll get back to some more? I think it's about to burst, but I think it's going to burst unevenly. I think in some pockets of the country, schools are already way ahead. And I don't know exactly why. I don't know. But I know that in other pockets of the country, teachers are still teaching the way they were 40 years ago. And the testing model is there and kids are sitting still all day. And I don't exactly know why 
change hasn't reached certain parts of the country more than others. And I shouldn't even say certain parts of the country because even in individual states, you have some districts that are just really progressive and they're doing amazing things and others where it's like you walk in and it might as well be 1968. Like, um, and hopefully the internet and technology will help us reach people more quickly and different PD models in, you know, that, that are, are getting, I don't know, I'm starting to meet more and more administrators that are just fantastic and really want to do the right thing. And they're, and they're brave about trying, trying stuff and standing up to, you know, maybe the people above them about what's right for the kids. So that brings me to number nine of this list, which is mm -hmm. education has an innovation problem. Your thoughts? So it says, are education leaders spending too much time chasing the latest tech trends to maintain what they have? I do think a lot of us can tend to, to have that bright, shiny object syndrome. And um, sometimes words like innovation can be sort of hollow, you know, if, if people say it a lot, it doesn't even necessarily mean anything. Um, what I like to see are models of it being done well. Um, this is why I really like the work that Don Wetrick has done with um, his students in Indiana. He's got a high school elective class that's an innovation class. Um, I, I do think sometimes we hear a word like innovation and everybody thinks that they all are interpreting it the same way and they're not necessarily. Um, I've got a concept on my blog that I talk about a lot um, called the Grecian urn, whether a, a, a task in class is a Grecian urn. And, and so what I'm talking about is um, like a social studies teacher who is supposed to be teaching a gre about Greek culture and the students spend a week and a half making paper mache urn and decorating them. And by the end of that, they haven't really learned anything about Greek culture and they haven't uh, done the analysis that they're supposed to be doing and the, and the comparison between Greek culture and our current, you know, modern culture and really extracting from that the learning that should happen. They're just painting a paper mache form. Um, and sometimes I worry that, that uh, teachers who hear this concept that we should be innovating don't even necessarily know what that would look like. Um, so again, I think we need to find models where it's rigorous and um, there's possibly a, a service aspect to it where students are, are impacting their communities and they're also integrating uh, the, the standards and the learning that they're uh, supposed to be getting out of it so that they come out of the process with uh, some skills that they can transfer into other areas of their lives and um, the knowledge to put it all into context. So w number one on this list actually sparked something right to your blog. Number one was kids are right, school is boring. And I, re and I remember, and it was, I'm sure it was a viral post for you, the one about fricking packets. <laughs> um, and that, that's what sparked me right away. Can you talk about fricking packets? The, <laughs> I can. The video and, Man, and, that video. and your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it really video... did hit home. It does. This kid's name is Jeff Bliss. He's 19 in the video, long hair. He looks like like Jay and Silent Bob, like this, <laughs> the one who talks. I guess it's Jay. He reminds me of him. And he's and it's a video of him just, just sort of talking back and throwing a little bit of a tantrum in class. What obviously happened right before the video is the teacher must have said something and he had just had it. So he stands up and he's yelling at the teacher saying, what he ends up saying to her is, I don't know how you expect your kids to learn. All you ever do is you come into class, you don't even teach. You just give us these freaking packets every day. Every day, that's all we're doing is freaking packets. If you want kids to learn, you've got to reach them. You've got to reach their heart. Not all kids learn this way. And so he's he's misbehaving, but he has such a solid, valid point. And I mean, and he walks out and he's just like, thank, like I can't remember how he says it, but he's basically like, you're going to thank me later for this and you don't even <laughs> need to have this job. And so I know that most teachers are just like, that young man needs to go to the office, but man, he was right. And I watch my own kids, they come home and they say, we just sat all day. Uh, Grant Wiggins' daughter, Alexis, did a piece a couple years ago where she shadowed high school students and she was just devastated by the end of this two or three days where she said, I, I couldn't stand it. I sat so much. And that's crazy. These are people that are almost adults and we're asking them to just sit and receive all the time. So I, I don't, I don't know what's happening. I really don't. My daughter's got a class right now where she says the teacher doesn't teach us anything. 
she just says that we just learn on our own. And I'm thinking maybe this teacher thinks that they're doing sort of like a blended learning type of a thing, but maybe it's not being executed right because the way the kids are interpreting is that this teacher doesn't teach us anything. So I don't know. It could be that my kids just have these adolescent personalities where they're just going to say negative things all the time, but they're just, they're not excited about school. They're not excited about learning. And maybe that's normal at that age, but it's, um, I don't know. It's, I think it's probably more common than not. I showcased that video. Uh, we have a tech integrators forum here and I showed the video and your, your blog post about mm. it. And it really struck a chord, I think with a lot of teachers and, and listen, me as a former teacher, I, I used to give a packet or two, you know, and yep. you think, geez, is, yeah. is that me? <laughs> um, yeah. And I also think back, I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Landry News. It's probably a fifth grade, sixth grade level book. No. It's probably an older book, but I used to read mm -hmm. it to my kids. And it's it's a, it's a great book, I, I thought. And uh, it's basically along that premise, this girl kind of takes a different tack. You know, this teacher mm -hmm. just kind of gives out packets and that's what they do all day. Mm -hmm. And she decides to write a newspaper and she, you know, he gives her free reign because she's you know, a good kid who sits over in the corner and she starts writing these articles about school and everything that's going on. And, and it, it makes him kind of reevaluate his teaching mm. and thinking about education. It brings him really out of that mode of here's a packet, you know, yeah. just go over the corner and do something, you know, don't, don't bother me kind of thing. So yeah. it's a really neat book though, but I, it, it I as I was it reading it to young kids, it made me think about you know, my own teaching and, and, you know, making sure I'm, I'm engaging. Yeah. Well, and the thing is to be fair to all the teachers that do it. I mean, there are reasons teachers do it. I mean, it's, if you're being pushed to cover a million standards and document it, you get your packets and you've got, you say it, check, I did it. And also teachers are just so overworked and have got so much on their plates, especially in the U S that sometimes it's just like, forget it. I'm just going to default to this. At least I'm doing something. And I think that's sad. I think there are probably a lot of teachers who, when they imagined themselves as teachers, that's not what they pictured themselves doing. And it's just, they sort of, fa sort of fall into it. It's like the junk food of, of teaching, you know, it's, it's quick and easy and you know, got that little yeah. feeling of satisfaction, but it's really not, not very nutritious. Right. Okay. So this is kind of a new segment I decided to do, which is called quotables. I've been on, uh, sometimes I like to my, my guilty pleasures are watching Vimeo videos sometimes, just mm -hmm. take, take an afternoon and mm. get myself buried in Vimeo videos, which is yeah. can take a long time. But then um, <laughs> there's, what is it, the quoting quotation, Brainy Quote. Brainy Quote will let you create an account, I discovered, and you can actually start um, you know, building a collection of quotes that you like. So mm -hmm. I put together a few and as I come across education ones, I always, of course, uh, pique my curiosity. So I pulled together three and I sent them to you and I, I saw you chose the Einstein quote. Yeah. Which was education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school. Yes. So you'd like me to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when I first read it, I thought it was you know, kind of like that, there's a Mark Twain quote that's very similar to, and I thought it probably is interpreted most of the time by people as a sort of snarky, like, you know, anti-school kind of a thing. But the way I'm interpreting it is really maybe a little bit different in that I think that, um, I was just talking to my kids about this this morning, my daughter's saying, why do I have to go to school? She said, all the stuff we learn doesn't really matter. And I said, in a way you're right, but part of it is is about just being around other people all day and listening to different people's perspectives on things. Even if you're just talking in the hall about stuff, it's exposure to other people's ideas. And I said, another thing is a lot of the stuff that you're learning, you're not gonna see its immediate application, but just as a culture, it helps for us to have a common body of knowledge about stuff. So even if you think that this stuff is useless, you're gonna be surprised by how it's gonna come up later. And it might not even come up. And this is the part where I think the forgetting about it is applicable that there's a there's a ton of stuff that I don't remember, a lot of specifics I don't remember about my own school years, but there's sort of big picture stuff that I just kind of have a deep understanding about. And that's not because my education was that great, but 12 years of exposure to a certain type of knowledge and, and people who all kind of buy it more or less as this is the truth and these are the facts and this is what science is and here's some books that we all are reading and I, I think it 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 has a bigger influence than we realize and um 
I don't know. It's almost like meeting somebody who has been to college versus somebody who hasn't, regardless of their major, the fact that they spent four plus years in an institution with people reading more books and having more conversations about stuff. There's a level of engagement maybe that you're getting and a level of confidence that you're getting from somebody that's completed a college degree versus somebody who hasn't. Even that confidence really is, is another piece of it, that they feel competent to engage in conversations that are a little bit deeper than maybe somebody that's just got a high school diploma. They won't, maybe they don't feel capable of it, even though they may know just as much as the person who, who left college. There's something about that regular discipline. Um, if, if your education was, was anywhere decent at all, <laughs> um, that can, can just help shape your character overall and, and other basic stuff following rules. I mean, there's a lot of negativity out there about compliance and about how all we ever do is teach compliance in American schools. And although I agree with that criticism, there is, I think there's something to be said for a person learning how to be compliant. I mean, we get drug prescriptions, we have to follow them. We have traffic laws that we have to follow. If people were just constantly flying by the seat of their own pants and doing what they wanted, uh, <laughs> we would have a really big mess on our hands. So, um, so I could probably talk about that quote for, you know, we get a bottle of wine and talk for three hours about it. <laughs> but I think there's a lot to unpack in there. Yeah, there is. Yeah. All right. So now it is time for the Speed Geek question. So Ooh. these are kind of short, you know, you can elaborate on them if you'd like. Okay. But we'll kind of rattle through some of them. Some of them are whimsical. Some of them are a little more serious. Some are hopefully just fun and to get to know you a little better. So okay. we'll spin the dial here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the first one is, come on now, wheel. Yikes, this is taking forever. Okay, <laughs> let's just go. Um, what's your favorite tablet or device? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't even, I, I had an iPad and my kids stole it. So <laughs> I would have to say, the, I, and I and I'm not an Apple person at all, even though I used to be. I've really switched over to PCs and Androids and everything. I'm the only one in my family. And so I got it so that I could refamiliarize myself with the iOS world. And um, I basically use it to watch Netflix. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it works, right? It yeah, works. yeah. There's some getting to know me right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is another one. So besides students, uh, who or what inspires you? Is this number 11? Uh, no, this is just off the speed, the wheel of <laughs> this speed. Is. Well, okay. this, yeah. Oh, say, oh, this yes. Isn't. Yes. Who inspired me to go into education? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I had, a, I had an amazing uh, pr a teacher in college who her name was Deborah Schmidt and she is no longer with us, but she was a, uh, my first methodology teacher. And she was just this fabulous woman from New York and she was super stylish and she cussed at us and she just was, mm. <laughs> I don't know. I just loved her. And she was also super sharp about relationship building with kids. And I think she's probably the first person that made me think maybe I could also teach teachers. So that was probably her. Sorry. I'm just reading the literal question. that Yeah, you gave no. Me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And it reminds me a little of, um, I don't know if you've read this book by Pat Conroy called The Lords of Discipline. He has a, a um, yeah, he has a quote about teachers that I think is one of the most powerful quotes on teachers. And I'll, I'll send you, it's, it's, yeah. it okay. falls along those lines of, you know, a great teacher really challenges you and, yeah, yeah. You know, and tames you, I guess, is the way he puts mm, it. So. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go. It's starting to go a little faster here. <laughs> well, you kind of answered this, but we'll go with it anyways. What's your favorite app? I'd have to say Voxer. Honestly, I'm so reliant on Voxer anymore that when people want to send me like a text or an email, I'm just, or if they want to have a phone call, I just say, <laughs> let me introduce you to this thing called Voxer. Do you use Voxer? <laughs> I do. It gets a little overwhelming though. It does. But well, that's the thing. The groups can be, can be pretty bad, but the one-on-one -on -one conversations, Angela Watson and I have been on Voxer for the last four years solid. We've got an ongoing conversation and we talk every single day. So I, I think it's those couple of conversations that are really helping. And the people that work for me, we, we speak through Voxer too. So I really count on it a lot. Nice. Yeah, it is. A, it is a good one. I'm on EduMatch. I don't know if you follow that mm, group. Yeah, that's Sarah. Oh, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. yeah. She, she was, I've interviewed her, and just when that was starting, and you just get so much stuff. It, it's great, but it's it's overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so the next one is, what is your favorite social network? And we'll... <laughs> because I'm old, it is Facebook. And I don't know if I'd <laughs> call it a favorite. It's just the one that I use the most. Instagram confuses me and makes me feel like a middle-aged woman. I can't find anything, and my kids are always having to help me. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably find Twitter to be the most useful, though, in terms of just finding information and, and being able to reach out to people and hear right back from them. And uh, so but those are pretty much my big three. I don't even know if I count Instagram. I avoid it whenever I can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Can I ask one more? Can we get yes. one more in there? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Let's see. Let me see what's a, a good one here. That uh, oh, Come on now. We asked that one already. Um, well, let me ask you this one from your perspective, because I think a lot of people would go with, with uh, your blog. What's your favorite educational blog? Okay. So... I'm going to give you three, but two of them you've already heard of. That's why I want to give you three. So Edutopia and MindShift are always super solid. And I go to them for like good, good quality information. But one that I really want people to check out is called The Great Handshake. Mm -hmm. And this is written by two guys who I guess have become, you know, internet friends of mine, um, Jason Bull and um, Adam Whitlatch. I hope I'm saying his last name right. These are just two guys from Pittsburgh. Actually, I think they're from different sides of Pennsylvania. Just such good writing, such good writing, so much heart. And like, I don't know, the great handshake. And, the, and they explain the title of that blog. But I try to share their posts whenever I can. Um, so I just want to elevate them a little bit. Um, also, <laughs> the Edified right Listener, then. Sherry Spellick, the, her blog is called The Edified Listener. She's written a couple posts for me also. She is just super thoughtful and, and a beautiful, beautiful writer. Um, she just really takes her time in her posts. So I would recommend that one too, The Edified Listener. Nice. I hadn't heard of either one of those. So yeah. I'll, I'll have some reading to do. So, well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, what, a, a kind of saying that I have that's based off of an old Woody Allen joke was, life doesn't imitate art, it imitates bad television. That's what Woody <laughs> Allen said. But I kind of have a twist on that, and it's life doesn't imitate art, it imitates the Wizard of Oz. And I think because of the three characters, you know, of heart, a brain, and courage, I think mm. are the three elements that I think go into any type of great endeavor. And when I read the, the Cult of Pedagogy, I see all three of those elements there. So um, thank you. Thank you. you do wonderful work and, and keep it up and I'll, I'll be reading. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was, that's probably the best compliment I've gotten all year or even last year too. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> thank you. That, that was beautiful. Great. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, I, I meant it. So thank you. Thanks for having me on. All right. <laughs> okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Yep.